Let's preview the Louisiana Raging Cajuns hosting the Tulane Green Wave with Green Wave sideline reporter and Before the Whistle podcast host, Maddie Hudak. It's Locked on Sunbelt. You are Locked on Sunbelt, your daily podcast on the Sunbelt Conference, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Dave Schultz, Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. That uh, that open was a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, all right, so we got Maddie Hudak on. Uh, she is the Green Wave sideline reporter for the Green Wave Radio Network. Uh, she also is uh, the host of Before the Whistle Whistle uh, podcast, as I mentioned. Uh, and Tulane publisher of SI Now. Uh, Tulane, compared to the Cajuns, have had a couple of tough football games, losing at home to Kansas State and going on the road and giving Oklahoma all they could handle, although wilting uh, in the end. They did get it down to five points and actually had the ball twice with a chance to take the lead and could not do it. Cajuns, though, are coming off an off week uh, after taking care of grambling at home through the air. And then on the ground against Kennesaw State, uh, we'll see who or may who or uh, who won't have the advantage uh, moving forward. Cajuns are rested, but Tulane is tested. Uh, we'll make that a T-shirt. All right, she is Maddie Hudak. She is the Tulane Green Wave sideline reporter, and she's on Locked On Sunbelt. Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. I'm your host, Dave Schultz. Big ball game in Lafayette, Louisiana this weekend. The Tulane Green Wave heading, I guess, uh, west, as the case may be, up to Lafayette to take on uh, the Raging Cajuns. We bring in uh, my buddy, Maddie Hudak, uh, from a sideline reporter with the Green Wave. She's the Tulane publisher with SI Now. She hosts Before the Whistle. Uh, She has every job possible under the sun, save some of them for the rest of us. Maddie, how are you doing? Thanks for hopping on. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, All right. So let's get right into this. What is the difference? Uh, Because these are two very strong personalities, very different. What is the difference that you have found uh, in your short time with John Summerall compared to uh, Willie Fritz? I mean, they're just totally different people. Um, I, you know, I didn't see what Willie Fritz's tenure was kind of like at the inception of it. It was right after I'd actually graduated as a student. But when I came in here, the first year for them was the two and 10 season. And so I think the approach to coaching was just so much different and required such a really a different way to go about things. Uh, But where this team is positioned now, John Summerall has just really been the perfect fit for this job. Um, What really has impressed me about this team under John Summerall is, and it's something that you saw under Willie Fritz, but the way that they just haven't given up over the last couple of weeks. And despite things that, you know, going down 21 to nothing in an SEC environment like that, was incredibly loud and they were kind of getting off to a slow start. It's really easy for things to kind of snowball out of control at that point. I feel like the team leadership has been so stout already. And to me, that really has to go back to the head coach with how little veteran returnees they had. Um, And just something that stuck out to me in that game, you know, when Bailey Despaini got ejected for targeting, John Summerall was the first one to kind of embrace him, have his arms around him. And then at one point during the game, I saw him go kind of each individual position group and have a little one-on-one meeting with them. I think just his human approach to coaching has really stuck out more than anything else. And I think it's really kind of been a defining trait of his. Well, yeah. How much turnover was there? Because his former team is 0-3 because there was a ton of turnover offensively and defensively. And obviously had some players join him uh, in Tulane and some coaches. How much besides Michael Pratt, how much turnover was there for the uh, Tulane Green Wave in 2024? I mean, starter-wise on defense, besides Patrick Jenkins, Eric Hicks, Tyler Grubbs, and Bailey Despaini, it's an entirety of new guys out there and a lot of guys that came over in that second portal window. Guys like Aiden Huntington are two defensive backs, Jonathan Edwards and Michael Robinson. They came over in that second portal window. Um, We've had, you know, at at times a true freshman in Jack Chinchu playing a lot at safety. Kevin Adams is a sophomore who's seen a little bit of playing time, but he largely had to go in and, and kind of be the guy when Bailey Despaini was ejected against Oklahoma. Uh, the offense has a little bit more returnees, I guess, on the offensive line and some of the skill players. But 
having a new quarterback that kind of just makes everything different. So to have all that, have all of the new coordinators at pretty much all places, it's a, a lot to kind of get really going, especially when you didn't have a starting quarterback named until two weeks before the season opener. And so to me, the offense really was kind of behind the eight ball for most teams and being able to find an identity that soon on. And so I, I think they made a lot of strides and I think we're kind of seeing them start to really mesh, especially after those two tough losses. All right, so we'll get to the quarterback here eventually. But so a lot of times coaches do inherit some talent uh, and they don't, they can't, I guess is the way to put it, put their, the way they want to run their program, what their offense and their defense is going to be. Because as Nick Saban say, why would we, you know, teach 22 guys the new offense when we can just teach one? So how much is this the John Summerall defense, the John Summerall offense compared to what Willie Fritz was running? Or is that something new these days because there is so much turnover? Uh, it's interesting, actually. The defensive side, there's actually been quite a bit of consistency and largely due to the fact that Sheil Wood, the previous defensive coordinator for John Summerall at Troy, came over to Tulane last year and implemented pretty much the exact same system that they run now. Same front, same type of coverage, largely. And so to me, having that ability to kind of keep that same system in place really kind of helps things on that side of the ball. But I think especially, you know, I know we're going to get to quarterback, but when you do have a new quarterback out there, the offense has to change with that guy, um, sure. with the skill players that you have out there. I think that you can kind of get a little more system-based on the defensive side of the ball and scheme-based, but you really have to, me, build around what you have out there. And, and Coach Craddock has said that, you know, he has kind of had to look back, change his approach at times. Like when Alex Bauman really came on as a receiving threat as a tight end, he kind of said, I have to almost go back to my roots as a tight ends coach at UAB. It's not something that we really had in our offense last year at Troy because they just didn't have the personnel to be able to do that. And so I think having a very adaptable staff that really designs it around the guys that they have, I think it would have been interesting to see if there was a little more turnover, how much that would have kind of been their own mark versus what they've done with these guys. But I think that's kind of what really stands out more than anything is it, it matches to the personnel and not so much what the coaches want. No, that's fine. I find that interesting. We're talking with Maddie Hudak from uh, Before the Whistle podcast and the uh, Green Wave two line, uh, Tulane sideline reporter. We'll try that again. Tulane Green Wave sideline reporter. Who gets about, Who gets more of a workout, by the way, on game day? You or the defensive backfield? Because you're going pretty good for 60 minutes. They're resting while the offense is out there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I certainly get my steps in on the sideline. Something I thought was a cool, fun fact on Summerall brought out just to talk about Bailey Despaini's leadership when he got ejected. He still had his catapult tracker on. He had something like 7,000 yards in that game despite only playing a little bit of it just because he was making so much ground up on the sidelines. And so I felt kind of validated by that and how much ground you can really make on, on just a, a short area of field. All right, let's take a timeout. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Maddie Hudak, Green Wave sideline reporter, on why the Tulane Green Wave went with Darian Mensah at quarterback uh, and have they tweaked the offense to his strengths. We'll do that when we come back after I tell you about FanDuel and game time. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of Sunday NFL ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com, download America's number one sportsbook. Tulane started as a five-and-a-half-point favorite. They're down to three. Was probably going to take the Cajuns with the line and the money line. Anyway, now we'll tell you about Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live event even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of uh, tickets. You can get a panoramic view of your seat in the app before you buy it. You can see where you're actually sitting. They have the lowest price guarantee or game time. will credit you 110% of the difference, and you get that game time ticket coverage. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. 
Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's game time. All right, Dave Schultz, Locked On Sun about your team every day. Let's get back to it with our guest, Maddie Hudak, Green Wave sideline reporter for the radio network of Tulane. We talk about why John Summerall went with uh, Darian Mensah at quarterback. All right, so let's jump to the quarterback. Uh, we'll just go right into it. Why Darian Mensah? He, you keep hearing it, but he does just have something about him. And he was the quarterback that when he came in, he immediately kind of put his own mark on it. He just had a little bit of swagger and poise to him. And he started to stack days in a way that the other quarterbacks just hadn't had the ability to do through the first couple of weeks of training camp. Um, And, you know, maybe things would have kind of evened out for them. Maybe they would have gotten their bearings, but I think there was so many question marks to answer that when this young gun just kind of comes out and he's really putting things together uh, I really liked that they made that decision that despite kind of, you know, having more experience with Kai Horton, having the pedigree with Ty Thompson, Darian came in and his teammates have said that he really calmed them down, especially in that first game to hear them talk about a redshirt freshman in that way already and hear how much the locker room really bought into that. I think it really says a lot about why they ended up going with him and, you know, to just kind of it's really hard to evaluate his first couple of games because I mean, any quarterback is going to struggle against the coverage that you faced against Kansas state. And then just the size and skill of those guys in Oklahoma and the speed and really their ability to kind of cover those guys and not have any type of separation with the wide receivers at all. Um, And there's just been a lot of pre-snap penalties on Tulane that have put him in some kind of tough situations, but he just kind of has that moxie and doesn't really get rattled. He's made some mistakes in games, but you've seen immediately it's not like he gets ghosts and starts to panic thereafter. He's really led some credible comebacks after some mistakes in game. And I think that kind of emulates a lot of what you saw in Michael Pratt, who said that, you know, he said that to John Summerall when he asked him his kind of evaluation of the quarterbacks back in December that to pay attention to this Mensa kid, he does have something about him. He really went out of his way to mentor Darian as a true freshman. So to me, that says a lot about such a leader like Michael Pratt and everything he had on his plate to really identify that in a young guy like Darian Mensa, you can really see just a lot of those traits in him today. So then how, what, how, how is Mensa different from the other quarterbacks and have they tweaked the offense? Although it's only been three games to what he does well. It's hard to say because that was one of my things with the quarterback competition was it was really hard to tell what the offense was going to look like because to an extent you're trying to solve questions on offense, but you also are trying to answer a question at quarterback and they aren't too dissimilar in what they can do. Ty Thompson obviously has a mobility level that the other guys don't, but at least from a passing game perspective, they all have that ability to execute kind of that same type of offense. But I'll say Darian just, he was a little quick of a processor and he, his uh, willingness to kind of go for it. But what I really took away was a lot of the throws by Ty Thompson and Kai Horton in training camp felt like they were trying to win a quarterback competition to me, Darian Mensa would go out there and it felt like he was playing quarterback and mm. just kind of relaxed out there. He's not, you know, he's not afraid of those deep shots and he makes that decision quickly. But what I really took away was he took the check downs. He really was getting the tight ends involved and the running backs involved in the passing game and was just kind of taking those shorter balls that those will live to see another down and get you through another game. Um, but uh, overall, I, I think that the offense itself You've seen it be a little bit more tailored almost to the skill players and the routes they can run because I think Darian Mensah has shown the ability. He can throw across the middle of the field and he can throw downfield pretty well just as much. And so kind of basing it around what Mario Williams can do, what Dante Fleming can do, um, he, he kind of has shown that he'll he'll kind of hit them wherever. Talking to Maddie Hudak, sideline reporter for the Tulane Green Wave and host of Before the Whistle podcast. All right, what was the biggest difference between those two ball games, Kansas State and Oklahoma? Uh, both winnable ball games uh, for the Tulane Green Wave may have won money on both of them, actually. Um, I'd say that Tulane, it felt like they were in the driver's seat 95% of the Kansas State game. And that's no disrespect to what Kansas State put out there, but it really sure. felt as if the momentum was on their side. 
even after some of the things like the scoop and score, the defense still held them to three and outs back to back in the fourth quarter. Um, and, and largely they controlled the tempo of that game. They were able to establish the run and establish the passing game in a way that Kansas State just wasn't. Um, the difference was Avery Johnson could run for his life and extend a lot of key drives, but it just felt like things were really clicking on Tulane's end until suddenly a, a lot of things weren't. It felt very much the opposite. It felt like they never really had the momentum on their side at all in the Oklahoma game. And to me, that really says a lot about the way that they fought and performed back. It didn't so much feel, you know, it did kind of feel like at that point, they were getting a little bit of that momentum back on their side. But I felt like that just felt like the speed of the game was really fast to start off. The environment was such a difference. Um, I, I really never heard anything like that as a sideline reporter. The only thing it comes close to to me is the Superdome in the glory days. Um, it, it's something like an 85,000 capacity stadium. And the, the fans are as far away as I am from my computer right now. They were right up on you. And so it was just definitely definitely loud in there um you could see that it was very difficult for Darian to even try to communicate with our center at all that wasn't really the case uh at Yeoman Stadium having that home field advantage so I feel like the chips were a lot more stacked against them in this Oklahoma game but I thought the fight they showed was more impressive than something I've seen really since you know the Cotton Bowl team and how much they were down and how easy it would have been to let that game get out of control and to make it a five point deficit have the offense get the ball back twice in their hands I thought yes. they showed a different fight that we hadn't seen out of them yet so they, they did have a little of that momentum with the pick six and the immediate yeah I think two three and outs in, in a row so so the difference was to me is that they should have beaten Kansas State they should have won that game whereas Oklahoma they could have won that game sure absolutely talking to yeah. Maddie who that yeah before the whistle uh podcast all right do we have any health issues uh because we did hear some people say, you know, they they've played a couple of, you know, really big P4 schools uh, compared to, you know, what the Cajuns have played so far. And the Cajuns are not as healthy as they probably like to be, although maybe getting healthier. Uh, any health issues from the last couple of weeks for Tulane? Um, I wouldn't say the last couple of weeks. And I'd actually say for I'm very surprised that they came out and not as kind of banged up as you might have expected. Right. Um, the only player he kind of mentioned as as a maybe is shoddy Clayton Johnson has something going on with him. Uh, we saw him kind of, you know, he didn't come back into that game for a large portion. And then our kicker, that's kind of something to watch. Um, he mm -hmm. got, you know, injured during the last week's game. And it's tough when you're a kicker and get an injury because it's kind of all predicated on just one exact thing that you're able to do. And you can't really, you know, you can get around something with a quarterback's injury, something with a wide receiver's injury a little bit. Um, if a kicker can't do the one thing they have to do, it makes it kind of a tough day. So that's really kind of something to watch there. And special teams can always kind of be that, that very sneaky equalizer in a game. Right. But all things considered, I was a little worried just looking at the size of Oklahoma going into that game and knowing that their conditioning and, and everything wouldn't have been as perfect as you would have wanted due to the hurricane. Uh, as It wasn't as disruptive, uh, anything close to Ida. But at the end of the day, it's not what you want as, as kind of that week of prep. But uh, all things considered, there's really no uh, glaring red flags, which, you know, that's to me, a lot of football, it, it, success is opportunity, health, and luck. And those two last ones are very intertwined to me. We're talking to Maddie Hudak on Lockdown Sunbelt, your team every day. She's the Green Wave side, Green Wave sideline reporter and Before the Whistle host podcast. Uh, all right, so I'm a big fan of the Cajuns playing Tulane. There's not a lot of that happening. Um is this the first time they've played since the bowl game? Is that have they played since the bowl game, the New Orleans Bowl? I, I, I don't think so. Big... Twenty eighteen, I believe. Reading the notes kind of earlier, oh, that okay. was the last time that they they'd met. Okay, so they have played. Oh, that's right. That was the uh, like the four overtime game or something like that. Was that the four overtime game that was in uh, New Orleans? There was a I'm four certainly... overtime game. They almost they almost killed Eli McGuire, <laughs> having decapitated him. Um, that was a game. Oh, so maybe they have played twice because they played in the. Yeah, Orleans that was bowl. the bowl game um, in December 2018. Oh, no. The okay. Auto Nation Cure Bowl. The Cure Bowl. So Tulane probably would have won that bowl game. They did. Think, it was their. Tulane it was won that game. First winning uh, season Cajuns, since 2013. Yeah, yeah, the Cajuns beat them in the New Orleans Bowl. And then they went down and they played a multi overtime game where both teams were completely gassed. All right, let's take one more time out. When we come back, we'll wrap up our conversation with Maddie Hudak, sideline reporter for the Tulane Green Wave. Who's got the advantage? The Cajuns, who have played against John Summerall, coach team, or John Summerall, who's coached against the Cajuns? 
We'll do that when we come back after I tell you about Roy. Hey, Sunbelt fans, have you heard about Roy? It stands for Return on You. And it's a new platform that lets you, the fans, get involved in NIL like never before by making contributions directly to your favorite athletes. By supporting players directly, you can help shape rosters, retain talent, and keep your favorite athletes out of the transfer portal. And as you all know, NIL has changed the game for athletes. Roy changes the NIL game for the fans. Fans' contributions are securely held and are only distributed if the athlete athlete makes the decision that aligns with the fan support. If not, if not, the money is returned to the fan. You can engage with athletes on their NIL journey. By using Roy, fans not only support athletes financially, but also become part of their name, image, and likeness NIL journey and help them succeed both on and off the field. Download, download Roy for iOS or Android and enter referral code Locked On, and you'll automatically be entered into a sweepstakes to win $5,000 cash. Visit joinroy.com for additional details. No purchase necessary, void where prohibited. Once again, get the Roy app for iOS or Android and start making an impact now on your favorite team. Use referral code Locked On for an opportunity to win $5,000 cash. Visit joinroy.com for more details. No purchase necessary, void where prohibited. Get off the sidelines and into the game. Get off the sidelines and into the NIL game with Roy. All right, Dave Schultz, Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. We wrap up our conversation with the Green Wave sideline radio reporter. She is Maddie Hudak. We talk about who has the advantage as the Cajuns and John Summerall are familiar with one another, uh, but obviously they haven't played when he's coaching Tulane. Also, is Tulane heading to the Pac-12? We do that next. She is the host of the Before the Whistle podcast and the Tulane Green Wave sideline reporter. She's Maddie Hudak on Locked On Sunbelt. But I'm a big fan of the two teams playing each other. But I, I got to believe that John Summerall's got a little bit of an advantage because he knows the Cajuns' personnel. Although the Cajuns know John Summerall's tendencies, they don't know Tulane's personnel. Where do you put that in there? Because I do find that I do find that kind of matchup fascinating. No, I was just on a radio call uh, talking kind of about this will be for us the first kind of game of chess. We'll get to see John Summerall really get to execute um, because last year you felt like you lost out a lot in the AAC with 50% of the teams having first year head coaches. You had really no hit and, and half them being new teams. You know, it was kind of like, OK, well, Willie Fritz has no coaching history against any of these guys. And, you know, not so much boring, but it, it you kind of just didn't get to look at that kind of history, whereas they, they've given John Summerall fits too. He talked about his first year at Troy. They went down 17 to nothing against the Cajuns. Eventually they came back and won that game, but being able to have those two games against them, it absolutely can't be discounted. Like you said, um, and uh, you, you could probably take a lot away. He said actually that the way that their offenses are both run, it sees a lot of similarities in one another. So if that's something that is a similar takeaway from Troy, then you might be able to do a little bit with something there. The other thing with Tulane too, is they've had to show their cards in these early kind of games. Uh, Even though conference play and the conference championship is the goal for them. Obviously you want to win the games that we just went through and you can't go out there with a vanilla game plan and try to have a chance against Kansas state or Oklahoma. So you kind of do have a chance, a sense of what you'll be able to see from this team. Uh, But I think it's going to be a really fun one to watch. And I think John Summerall just might have that little edge because of that, but it'll, it's, it's going to be a really good matchup right. for what them and it, an important one for them at that. Yeah. The Cajuns, you know, they, again, the level of competition, they're stepping up in a big way, but you know, a couple of workmen like uh, wins, they, they threw it against Grambling, which was a little bit surprising. And then they ran it down Kennesaw uh, state's throat. Uh, and with, uh, you know, a, a run, a starting running back that was banged up an offensive line that was banged up. So that looked pretty good. And it'll be interesting to know, how these coaches feel because, you know, we see it as well. The Cajuns are getting a week off in week two, but it really is closer to almost week 10 when you go back to training camp uh, and, and so forth. So it's an early off week, but that's got to help out the Cajuns as well. Whereas, you know, they did not play a couple of cupcakes too late, right? They play, they hosted K-State and then you went, uh, they went to Norman uh, and had some, you know, travel issues coming back. So it, that's got to be at a little advantage for the Cajuns. Yeah, it, it definitely is. You can't discount just fresh legs and not having just the kind of mental draining that these last couple of weeks have had for Tulane. Um, but at the same time, you, the game speed 
that Tulane has seen these last couple of weeks. It, right. It's really not co comparable to what a lot of G5 teams ever see uh, in non-conference play, let alone one this early on in the season. And so I do think just the game speed has been so fast for them. And I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of a chip on their shoulder kind of going on for Tulane. I think they're a little uh, P-I-S-S-E-D off right now. And I think you're going to see a little bit of that emotion kind of come out. Um, I'd almost say if they had gotten away with one of those two wins these last couple of weeks, this would be a game you'd be worried about their heads being in. But I think, too, just the fact that so many of these guys are from Louisiana, it's not lost on them. One of John Summerall's stated season goals was to win the state of Louisiana. They're 50% of the way to doing that. And I think with all of that kind of behind it, it's going to be it's going to be a very interesting matchup of like you just said I'm not entirely sure who actually has the edge in a lot of these conversations I think you could make a case for both sides. Uh I agree with that. We're talking with Maddie Hudak, uh sideline reporter for the uh, Tulane Green Wave and before the whistle host on uh, their podcast. Uh all right, so let's talk matchups because as I mentioned, the Cajuns, when I was breaking down the Cajuns, I went from they went overrated and you know, could they compete for the top spot in the Sun Belt because all of a sudden they got an experienced offensive line. They have some good running backs. The uh, youngest portion of their team may be their wide receivers, but maybe the most talented. They have an experienced off, uh, defensive line, linebackers, and really experienced uh, defensive backfield. The only question mark was the quarterback. Uh, and, you know, you could read between the lines, Ben Waldridge was going was gonna to get that gig, and he's played well in two ball games uh, so far. What are the strengths of Troy's defense to try and stop the Cajuns, who, again, have won each game differently? I think you mean Tulane's defense, but it's fair enough because they carry over the same one. You said Troy's defense. Oh, I did. Yeah, that's going <laughs> to happen. It, yeah, yeah, as we said, it, it is very similar, and it largely is going to be Troy's defense because Gasparato comes slipped. over with him. Yeah, exactly, but it's it's not wrong in that it, it's really going to be the same system. Um. You've seen Tulane's defense, they, to me, have been the strength of the team the last couple of years. I'd argue they were not for the first two weeks of the game. They were the ones, to me, that really held down the ship uh, last week against Oklahoma. And pass rush, to me, was very much of a concern for this team, especially at that bandit role. Um, someone we saw that we haven't seen all year yet at Oklahoma was Javon Carter, who I believe they got from might have been Grambling. It might have been Kennesaw. It was one of those um, FCS programs that he was hurt to start the season. And he went out there. He just has a little bit of a different body type to him. I looked it up. He's 6'4". Uh, Terrell Allen, who was playing a lot in uh, the first couple of games, was six feet. That length is just a completely different story. Um, and you started to see Aiden Huntington also really start to get through. On his side, they finally started to affect who was a surprisingly mobile quarterback in Jackson Arnold. Um getting three sacks back there and really kind of starting to get there. I think if their pass rush is able to get off again, that's going to be the way that they beat teams. Cause that's, it's the easiest said and done. You can't get anywhere if the quarterback really can't get anything off. But I think the linebackers have been such a, just a, a point of strength for this team. They've had some missed assignments here and there, but they have just kind of been the heart and soul of this team. They blitzed a little more than you would have expected against Oklahoma. But I think again, that just kind of, trying to get this pass rush off, but they're pretty sticky in coverage as well. Uh, they've been, they've allowed a little more rushing than I, I would say that they've allowed over the last couple of seasons, but I think their communication and coverage has really kind of started to shore up. So I think you're really looking for a complete game out of that unit where they let uh, obviously that game get 21 to nothing, but really held things down uh, in all three phases after the fact. So it'll be curious to kind of see really what the point of strength is. Cause I think, now that they've kind of found an identity, you'll get to really kind of see those strengths come out. I always wonder about that complete game because we hear that from the coaches, and that's Fair really enough. difficult when the other team is trying to do – trying either to score against you or to stop you. It's one thing, you know, play a complete round of golf, all right? I got no defense. But when the other team is trying to stop what you do, and you hear this from coaches all the time, if we do what we do, we'll be okay. Well, okay, but the other team is going to say the same thing. <laughs> It's, it's a really good point, and it actually was something that I think became a little bit of a psychological issue last year was chasing that perfect game, and it kept being brought up every single week, that complete game, and I am I got to a point on my podcast where, you know, at what point is this kind of just a fruitless endeavor here? What is the perfect game? So I do kind of agree with you on that perspective. Um, I, I think at least unit-wise, uh, I think it's exactly like you said, it's so hard to have a complete game in all three phases, but at least from the defensive perspective, they made really credible comebacks in those kind of fourth quarter late 
stands, you'd like to see them kind of make uh, at the set the tone early kind of thing. So I guess less so of a complete bit game and more of a strong start. All right, a couple more questions for uh, Maddie Hudak, Green Wave sideline reporter on the radio network uh, and host of Before the Whistle podcast. Uh, so one place that I would think Tulane has the advantage, although they have played some Power Five teams and not as beat up as much as we thought. You know, the Cajuns have only played Grambling and Kennesaw State, so I'm going to guess that that defense hasn't played much more than 45 minutes yet, whereas, you know, the number one defense for Tulane has been on the field for all 60 minutes, at least in the last two ball games. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, it is an 11 a.m. game, so it'll actually be getting hotter as the game goes on. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whose defense can stay, you know, in that heat uh, on the on the Cajuns' turf. Yeah, again, it, this game's going to be fascinating just from the – is it going to be fresh legs win the day or is it going to be kind of just those really hard mental tests and going up against a team that things were going at just a completely different speed than they're probably going to see for a long time this season. Uh, it's going to be curious to see kind of where that wears on as the game goes on. Uh, Tulane has not been uh, lucky. They've not been kind to us with any of our start times to start the year so far, except for our game to start the season. Um, that one in Oklahoma was a scorcher. We have an 11 a.m. game after the one um, now uh, back at Yeoman Stadium. So uh, these two teams, at least you could say that that heat advantage is pretty even for them both, having them both sure. be from this area. Uh, but it, it'll, yeah, it'll be a good question of where does that mental toughness really start to matter more? Is it when your legs kind of go out or is it going to ultimately mean more even when their legs are kind of wasted that they've been through these tough moments these last couple of weeks it's gonna be a curious battle all right to wrap things up with maddie hudak tulane heading to the pac-12 <laughs> listen it's gaining a lot of smoke um i don't oh. really see you know if the money there is right i think that if you're trying to really compete for that competitive g5 spot they very quickly solidified them as one especially with a commitment to football and so i, I you know i think also too pairing them up kind of with Memphis, I think you get a lot more done in these kind of things, having a little bit of leverage in that aspect. And I think you would lose so much colored uh, history for Tulane, both from a football and basketball perspective with Memphis, that I like how they've kind of been packaged together. But uh, I think, you know, if, if the right opportunity opens up and if the Pac-12 is that, things move very quickly uh, in this landscape yeah. as we see. And who, who knows by the end of the next couple of weeks what we'll be saying at this point. Matty Hudak, Green Wave sideline reporter on the radio network, host of the Before the Whistle podcast. What is going on with the New Orleans Saints on a side note? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you. Um, I turned on that game. Uh, you know, we got home very late from that travel day. I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know who put a nickel in the Saints two weeks in a row. But um, Clint Kubiak, man, I guess he really is that dude. She's a Maddie Hudak. Really appreciate your time uh, from uh, to be on a uh, locked on Sunbelt. Uh, enjoy Lafayette. Be sure to get some good eats. All right. Thanks so much for hopping on. Absolutely.